Hello, everyone. Welcome to Max Mean, Mathematics and Computer Science for Materials Innovation. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, my collaborator, Dr. Daniel Schwalbe Koda from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, who will talk about representation learning for materials transformations, synthesis, and simulations. Over to you, Daniel, please. All right. Thank you very much, Vitaly, for in introducing me and for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, it's very nice to, to talk a little bit about this work that I've been doing the past few years about representation learning, again, for materials transformation, synthesis, and simulations. But understanding the, the context of Maxman and knowing that I come from a material science background uh, instead of uh, mathematics or computer science, I thought it would be nice to chat a, a bit about how do we see materials innovation from the material science perspective, and also connect it back to the idea of representation. Often when we're talking about materials uh, development, materials discovery, we see something that looks like a pipeline that I show here on the screen. You have the design process of a material in which you choose the, the parameters, you choose all the things that go into the material itself, for example, the composition, the structures, the synthesis processes, and so on. Go to the lab, synthesize these materials, and then you go back and forth into a loop of resynthesizing, characterizing these materials, assessing their performance, for example, uh, uh, reaction, uh, their behavior under certain reaction conditions or their, their really properties that you're interested in, and going looping back to the design aspect. So you iterate your previous knowledge about what, how does a material perform and what does it do and how can we do better? So representations and really computation from, from our side is the way that we talk with all of these different aspects of materials innovation. Materials design requires representation because it's intrinsically connected to the data that we generate in each one of these uh, parts of the, the pipeline, the design pipeline. However, if you go back over 100 years, you're going to see that data is also translated into materials innovation. So over 100 years ago, the BASF team led by Carl Bosch and Alvin Mittash went into an undertaking to try to discover new catalysts for synthesis of ammonia, which at the time was extremely important for, uh, was lacking and up to date, of course, is still extremely important, not only for, for, uh, for um, the, the uh, weapons that they were interested in, for example, in the First World War, but also in the case of uh, everything today, agriculture, in the case of fertilizers. So what they did is they, they, they went to the periodic table and they tried to explore several combinations of materials that would work as catalysts, promoters, and so on to enable the synthesis of ammonia in, in high temperatures and high pressures that were the, the conditions that were determined to be the most, uh, the most uh, favorable for the synthesis of this from hydrogen and, and nitrogen. And what they found is uh, in, in the span of three years, they tested over 6,500 they performed over 6,500 different tests, and in, in, over the course of the project, they performed over 20,000 tests with more than 4,000 substances. So this is an immense amount of data that ended up being translated into a catalyst that is very similar to the one that we still use today. And it really speaks to the power of uh, amassing large amount of data, interpreting large amount of data, and exploring synthesis spaces effectively in such a way that is synthesis in combinatorial spaces, the composition spaces, and so on, in such a way that we can try to really find materials that perform better than the ones that we have today, materials that will enable um, all of these different uh, processes that we're interested in from the commercial perspective, from the industrial perspective, or the, the small scale perspective. So if you see what happens nowadays in terms of materials innovation, the paradigms usually look like these uh, funnel-like approaches. You're gonna see in the literature uh, ver uh, various approaches that look like the funnel that I'm, I'm showing here, in which you start with large, amount, large amounts of data, such as screening materials using machine learning that takes millions of data points as input and down selects it to, to a few thousands to even up to a million different data points that you can uh, try to screen using more expensive methods such as quantum mechanics. And then you can try to go down the, this route uh, to synthesize, characterize the materials, all the way to the discovery. From the computational perspective, you're usually focused in these two first tiers of, of materials screening, which is uh, screening using machine learning methods or quantum mechanics and so on. And the underlying 
idea behind it is that we have structures as we, we always have in terms of materials and we have the space of properties. We're trying to make a mapping between structures and properties. So performing forward predictions from the structure space to the property space, and that often requires simulations as in the case of quantum mechanics, uh, density functional theory and so on, or even machine learning, which requires developing neural presentations, but also the idea of inverse design which is given a certain property that's targeted, we have to find the structures of interest that match that property. Now, it's very clear that representation is on the left side here. It, it plays a big role in determining what is this, how this map is going to look like from structure to property. But even more important, if you think about it, is that not everything about the structure is very well defined in terms of, uh, say, a crystalline structure or a a ground state, a geometry, and so on. For example, complex phenomena such as synthesis, phase transformations, are not static entities in the structure space that can be represented with one single um, description, one single set of basis functions, for example. But rather, there are complicated processes that will happen dynamically at high temp higher temperatures might not be uh, so easily described by one single entity. So we can look at a lot of different materials that have uh, all of these uh, interesting properties from the perspective of synthesis, from the perspective of applications and so on. In this talk, I'm going to focus, uh, half of this talk at least, I'm going to focus on an important class of energy materials, which are these materials called zeolites, even though we, uh, you, you probably interacted with it through, for example, um, cat litter that has uh, materials to, to zeolites to uh, absorb uh, um, ions and, and molecules that in, uh, are involved in, in pet urines, for example. But in a lot of industrial applications, it's, it's a very powerful and very important material. Just to give you an example, in the area of catalysis, zeolites uh, make 18% in value of all catalysts in, commercialized in the world. The products of zeolites are valued in trillions of US dollars from petro petrochemical to catalytic converters and many more. And of course, it has a lot of applications in uh, emission control, CO2 capture, and biomass conversion, and so on. So interesting aspect about these materials is that they're porous materials, and uh, the pore shapes and sizes are determined by the polymorph of interest. You can construct a zeolite framework often using a silica tetrahedra, which are then four connected tetrahedra that assemble themselves in different polymers. So that's forming a, a four connected graph in the, in the 3D space and in this periodic 3D space in such a way that we have periodic boundary conditions being satisfied by this. So each one of these polymers has different pore sizes, shapes, and topologies in such a way that we can change the function of the material from the perspective of catalysis, for example, or adsorption, uh, just by changing which polymorph we're going to be using for that particular, um, say, task that we're interested in. So uh, changing the polymorphism side involves changing the synthesis conditions in order to obtain those materials. For example, uh, zeolites are often synthesized using hydrothermal treatments that take uh, as inputs a series of, of different um, inorganic and organic agents and organic and or, uh, organic precursors, for example, all the way from, from uh, aluminosilicate precursors to organic molecules that are um, are put together in a precursor gel in this hydrothermal treatment in such a way that inorganic, um, inorganic precursors such as uh, silicate or, or the, the alumina, they start, to, uh, they start to assemble together around these organic structure directing agents, these templates over here, in order to form a crystallized framework, which is later... Um, uh, which is later uh, subject to, subjected to, to higher temperatures to burn the molecules and form pores, which are, are void, basically pores, that for, through which molecules can diffuse through and you can actually perform, say, catalytic reactions inside these uh, porous networks. But then analyzing what is the relationship between all of these synthesis conditions, all of these uh, uh, intermediates and, and understanding it over the time scale of weeks, which is what it takes to synthesize most of these frameworks is re really complicated. So one of my examples uh, to motivate in this talk is how do we count, how can we try to model these 
complex phenomenon and how what insights can we draw from representational learning in order to really connect synthesis to structure but also to properties in the end so uh, in this talk I wanted to talk about all of these different aspects and how they connect back to representational learning and to the ideas that have been discussed over here in this uh, in this conference so I was, I'll talk a bit about phase transformations of these materials and how they connect back to representations how to model uh, synthesis conditions how to sample new uh, geometries and how to, can we improve the representation representation learning of these systems by uh, uh, overall so starting off by with the idea of phase transformations I wanted to start with by connecting with uh, with the previous talk and and talking a bit more about graph representations and how can we try to interpret physical processes using graph theory so it's known that uh, graphs are natural ways of representing some of materials. For example, the case of molecules is very easy to, to, to say that atoms are nodes and uh, covalent bonds are edges in these graphs. Sometimes you can put labeled edges to, to make non-covalent bonds also be edges of your graph. Uh, and that translation is a very straightforward for the case of molecules because they're non-periodic systems. In the case of periodic systems, you have to expand a little bit your, your intuition about how to define your graph it's often uh, required to represent your graph as a multi-graph actually in which uh, multiple edges between two nodes are allowed or self edges also are also required in order to represent the periodic boundary conditions so here are two examples of of uh, multi-graphs and, and the crystals they represent and how this mapping can be performed but this is particularly interesting, particularly interesting in the case of zeolites, which has very well-defined covalent bonds and, and a very well-defined network that's uh, that's pretty uh, pretty easy to translate into a graph. So much that the community has, uh, for a long time, been thinking about integration of graphs and, and analysis of zeolites through graphs. So the idea is that you can take a framework, each one of these frameworks, and of course construct a unit cell graph from it just by taking silicon atoms. For example, as as nodes of the graph, and, and then oxygen bridges as, as edges of the graph. But as you can see, obviously, just the unit cell graph doesn't respect the periodic boundary conditions. So you can loop back these edges that would go across a cell boundary into the unit cell again by by adding these additional connections that make the graph periodic. So uh, we can do that, and we can end up with a periodic graph for each one of these zeolites. But one of the questions that we might ask is, how do we compare graphs? For example, if we took we took each, any arbitrary crystal for which the graphs are well defined, um, and we we mapped these crystals, the unit cells, to graphs, and we try to compare, for example, graph of A with graph of B over here, perhaps it's not so clear because these graphs have different number of nodes. Whereas uh, the we can just change the the unit cell over here, and your representation has to be uh, sorry, and and your comparison has to be consistent. So one of the ways that we can do to compare graphs in a more fair way would be to take supercell of each one of these crystals and try to match the number of nodes inside of each one of these supercells in such a way that in the end we have two graphs which are somewhat easy to compare so by easy I mean they are they have the same number of nodes and I can try to look for all of these diff different supercells up to a up to a cutoff and see what is the minimum distance between the two graphs and now the distance requires a definition of a graph distance for example you could look at the graph edit distance between these two graphs which can be interpreted in the, in the material science world as taking this first graph and converting it into the second graph, which corresponds to taking to the crystal, the original crystal of, of this graph, taking these two extra bonds per supercell and breaking them apart, and then distorting the crystal, the, the atomic bases and the lattice at constant connectivity in such a way that we get graph B. So this is an interpretation of graph at a distance. And I find it interesting because if you actually perform this kind of analysis and apply it for the case of zeolites that I was showing before, what you're going to see is that um, graphs as uh, zeolites or frameworks that share similar graphs, sometimes even isomorphic graphs in these uh, periodic uh, within the periodic boundary conditions, uh, 
they are known to be related by some graph uh, by by some transformations. So what happens is sometimes you can start with one of the frameworks, and then you heat it up. For example, as you can see here on this X-ray diffraction pattern, uh, you can heat it up, and you end up with a completely different framework, which was not obviously related to the first one. But when you analyze it from the perspective of graph at a distance, you're going to see that the two of them are actually close in 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 the graph space, meaning that perhaps the idea of having similar graphs explains transformations because uh, the number of bonds that have to be broken and reformed in order to convert to graphs is is zero. The net number of bonds that have to be broken and reformed is zero if the graphs are isomorphic. So the idea is that we can try to convert, interconvert between different structures in order to, to, to obtain a second one from the first one if we know how to compare them according to their graphs. But just can, computing graph isomorphism for all of these systems may not be enough. We might be interested in really understanding how close these structures are in the graph space. So we might try to look for a continuous distance for crystal graphs. And one of the one of the ideas that we had in the past was to use um, different metrics, graph kernels, and so on. And we ended up landing in this key measure we were proposed in this 2017 Nature Communications paper that takes the distance distribution of each node. So you see how many nodes are at uh, d distance away of of the central nodes for each one of these nodes in, in the in the graph. And then you compute the metric that's defined as the network node dispersion that takes the, the jensen shannon divergence over here or all of these distributions of distance distributions, of, of all of these distance distributions. And then you, you, of course, compare it according to the average distribution that you get for your system. Um, and the, then the graph distance, the distance between two graphs, according to this D measure, is, is uh, made out of three different components, an average distance between two graphs, because between these average distributions, a network dissimilarity metric, and some term that's related to the alpha centrality of the graph. So the authors of this paper try to, to prove it and analyze it in, in detail. So I'm not going to go too much in detail uh, with which uh, why these terms are necessary, how do they influence the final, uh, the final graph metric. But I, I wanted to talk about how can we use it to interpret these physical processes that happen. And so when you actually take, go back into the zeolite literature and try to see all of these transformations that happened before, and especially in the case of diffusionless transformations, such as the one that I showed before, you're going to see that we hypothesized, as, as I, I explained, we hypothesized that structures that are graph similar actually should have a lot of diffusionless transformations, or all of the diffusionless transformations that we observe in the literature are actually related to similar graph structures, which is exactly what happens. This is the distribution of all data points of all transformations and the graph distance and another structural distance that we chose here based on soap descriptors to, to quantify whether that would happen or not. There's one single outlier for that, which is a transformation that requires a stress of, on the order of 3.2 gigapascal, which is uh, really an extreme condition for, for the case of these transformations to happen. But then comparing it with other physical processes, such as intergrowth between true structures and phase competition, you see that there's statistical significance for the case of diffusionless transformations. But there, there, there are other interests in the synthesis of these materials that uh, we might want to target and we want, might want to explain with representation. For example, can we synthesize intergrowths on demand? Can we try to find new representations to synthesize, find new synthesis routes for these structures in order to, to obtain them? So that goes to the second part of, of this talk, which is finding new shape representations and trying to quantify, correlate zeolite synthesis using the representations of the shapes. Again, I showed you before that the synthesis process happens by, by crystallizing uh, an initially uh, amorphous aluminum silicate gel into a crystalline framework. And that is used by varying these synthesis conditions over here. So the space of, of zeolites is, is uh, pretty vast. We have hundreds of known frameworks. And the space of organic molecules that can lead to the synthesis of these materials is even larger, right? We, we have uh, an essentially infinite number of molecules that can be uh, 
used to synthesize these materials. So it's a space that cannot really be enumerated. But if we use simulations, especially in the case of the high throughput simulations, automated frameworks to do that, we can still screen a large number of uh, pairings between all of the different known frameworks and uh, most of the known molecules that have been used to synthesize zeolites before. So this is something that, uh, that I've done before, which is taking over 200 frameworks and taking over 500 of these, these different organic structure protecting agents, or OSDAs for short. Um, I calculated over half a million different poses or, or confirmations of molecules inside these frameworks and, and using atomistic simulations quantified binding metrics between frameworks and molecules. What you end up with is uh, basically something that looks like this. You have on, on one side of a matrix, you have all known frameworks, and on the other side of the matrix, you have uh, all the known uh, templates that are used to typically used to synthesize these materials. So we can look at the matrix from the perspective of a framework, say varying the molecule and finding what are the good molecules for synthesizing a given framework. But more importantly, we can also look at what happens in actual synthesis conditions of these materials, which is taking a molecule and seeing what is the framework that's most likely to be the outcome of that particular uh, synthesis condition. So that is really a binding matrix that we have and that we're looking from above over here. Um, we have a binding energy. Each one of these elements is a binding energy. That is the interaction energy between a molecule and a particular framework that can be normalized according to different units. We can look at this matrix across roles, right? Fixing the column and, and looking at roles. That is taking one different framework and look at all of the molecules that can be used to try to synthesize this framework or from, my, uh, from the idea of phase competition, which is taking each one of these molecules and seeing what are the frameworks most likely to, uh, to be crystallized by this particular molecule. So the whole idea here is for us to try to find the best pairs between molecules and frameworks in order to increase the likelihood of success of the synthesis of a particular targeted material. But then traversing this matrix-like relationship to design intergrowth structures, which are two frameworks now intergrown together in a single crystal without, a, without an actual defect on the interface is much more complicated. So we have to, to find new ways to explore the, the space of molecules in order to design combinations and pairings of framework with frameworks, which are not so easily described by this matrix-like relationship. So with that, we go back to the space of representations and we talk about how uh, can we represent a molecule in order to explore the space. For example, of course, we can design a molecule by understanding that it's often represented as a chemical graph, but also in the case of synthesis, you have to understand that this is uh, not just a graph, but also a 3D structure that is dynamic and has, uh, it has a certain potential energy surface, has a, a particular volume, has a particular shape, uh, under, under a certain confirmation and so on. So I hypothesized here that uh, we can try to traverse the space of molecules by first correlating it to the shape. It is known that the interactions between the molecules give, give, and the frameworks gives rise to certain pore uh, sizes and, and shapes that is, are related to, to the shape of the molecule itself. So we can try to find a baseline to have a very simple representation of a molecular shape, which it goes beyond just taking a look at all of the, the, the scriptures that we could for this 3D confirmation, but just takes a 3D structure of the molecule and then performs a very simple principal component analysis to or just project these molecule onto a, a 2D plane and then see how large are these projections on the 2D plane, according to these two principal axes over here. So taking the axis one is the longest one and the axis two is the shorter one. Um, and the idea then is that we can try to perform shape interpolations in the space of molecules. So because we have a metric, uh, 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 a descriptor here, a two-dimensional descriptor uh, that maps molecules into shapes, we can try to traverse this space and compare molecules which are known to be good for certain frameworks and try to interpolate them to generate an intergrowth structure. So the idea over here is that perhaps you have a molecule that's it's good to synthesize one particular framework, which is here known as this code with this code AEI framework. Uh, 
another molecule that's good, good to synthesize the chabocyte framework, which is known by the CHA code. And perhaps we want to synthesize an intergrowth structure between them. So what we can do is we can look at the molecules from the shape space, which is now very well defined. And we can try to perform shape interpolation in order to find structures or, or molecules that uh, are potentially good for synthesizing intergrowths between the two of them. So if you look at the maps of uh, interaction energies and shapes and how do they relate to the structures of interest, you're going to see over here that if we plot the binding energies of each one of these molecules, all of the molecules we simulated really is yes, in these hexagonal bin, uh, bins, uh, but specifically for these molecules 1, 5, and 14, you're going to see that molecule number one is uh, more selective towards these AEI framework as seen here, as seen here for the distance to the diagonal. The molecule number five is more um, selective towards the chapazite framework as also seen here by the distance to the diagonal. And the molecule number 14 is perhaps good for both of them according to the binding matrix as expected by this shape interpolation um, hypothesis that I showed before. But now when you look at the space of the shape itself and plot in colors, the, what are the binding energies, what you're going to see is uh, um, a couple of different domains of selectivity in which the blue region corresponds to all molecules whose shape is selective to the AEI framework. And the red region is all molecules containing particular shape, which ends up being on average more selective towards uh, the Chabasite framework. And the molecule number 14, as I mentioned before, is some sort of shape interpolated molecule as you have over here. So we showed these results to our collaborators and they, they, were, uh, they were very interested in exploring these uh, structures in the lab. So they brought it to, 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 to their experimental lab and uh, actually obtained the, the intergrowth between the Chava site and AI structures as predicted or as, uh, as uh, observed here in the previous plots. You can see these evidences by the X-ray diffraction patterns, but also the, the uh, high resolution uh, STM images by, the, by Tom uh, Wilhelmar in, in Stockholm University, which uh, really showcases this uh, very well-defined uh, stacking pattern or intercalation of these stacking patterns between these Chapazite framework and the AEI framework. And the idea is that we can, can take these materials and use them as catalysts, which is very interesting for a lot of applications. For example, if you look at the methanol to olefin uh, reactions, um, the selectivity of, of the reaction towards certain olefins is dependent on the shapes of the pores in which the, the reaction is, is happening, the shapes of the cavities and so on. But if you use an intergrowth framework, you're gonna have exactly the in-between between, uh, the in-between selectivity of the two end members of these integral structure. Interestingly, when we when we analyzed them, and, and our colleagues at uh, ITQ in Spain and analyzed it, analyzed it as the for for the DNOX reaction, they they observed that in the copper chabazite AI framework synthesized with this uh, molecule that was proposed here uh, outperformed the, the baseline copper chabazite framework in the DNOX reaction and. Uh, even after hydrothermal aging in terms of, of stability of this material, both at lower temperatures and higher temperatures, which is very interesting because these are the kinds of materials that are used in catalytic converters for uh, diesel engines. So it really shows us that a representation really in theory can control synthesis and can inform us, gives us insight, insights on how to make it more intuitive, how to make molecular design more intuitive in the space of material synthesis, and how to use that all the way to the keys of improving the catalytic behavior of these structures. So uh, this is a very interesting result and we, we wanted to, to follow up on that. And one of the ideas is always to try to simulate and get mechanistic insights on what is going on inside the pores in order to understand how is this uh, reaction taking place or how stability is, is um, influenced by the synthesis conditions. And so uh, all of these exploration of, of, of the mechanisms of reaction requires often simulations, and, but more importantly, what we often refer to as sampling. Sampling basically means that we have uh, a space of 3D structures that we could explore, and we just have to sample the ones corresponding to 
say the reaction pathways of interest, thus being being uh, structures that are physically meaningful and not just basically random movements in three D point clouds uh, of the three D point clouds. Um, so correlating the idea of sampling to the idea of representations, we really have to understand how to use representation learning and how to use all these different uh, systems to sample new molecular uh, molecular structures or new new structures in general. So uh, over the course of this presentation, we started off by looking at graphs and then we we went on to to export shapes and very simple representations of the shapes with these uh, two-dimensional flattened version of a molecular shape to now explore the idea of a conformer. So if before we, we could change the distance between these uh, atoms and it would not modify the graph connectivity itself. So the adjacency matrix remains the same. Maybe the labels of, of the edges changes, but uh, the connectivity remains the same. And now each tiny movement that I make in each one of these atoms corresponds to a different point in what is called these potential energy surface. That means moving atoms around in a 3D space uh, changes the energies and also imparts a particular force in all of these different atoms of the system. So there are several ways to do that, to, to make that kind of mapping. And most, most uh, popular one is the use of density functional theory to do so, which will take, you know, there, there's a very well-defined theory that allows you to compute using uh, quantum mechanics at a certain other uh, approximations, what is going to be a predicted energy to a particular uh, given structure. Um, and of course, uh, that is, is reliable and very popular, but it's also very slow. So if you go to systems with large number of atoms, you're not going to be able to compute them without having to pay a, a large price that scales with n cubed in terms of computational cost for, for simulating these structures. So what a lot of people have been doing in the past few years is to try to bypass that structure potential energy surface mapping, moving away from density functional theory calculations to potentials that are described by machine learning. And so that basically takes uh, things such as graph neural networks or uh, some neural networks or other machine learning mo models uh, trained on given representations, which turns out to be much, much faster than a density functional theory calculations. So uh, the idea is that given the data that you can train on, you can use and generate by, by, by simulating these structures, you can train a model that's much faster in approximating these potential energy surface. However, especially if you go to graph neural networks, which are very good in terms of accuracy, they're, they're going to fail in a lot of different aspects. So for example, here, what I show is a molecule that have been, has been, uh, uh, whose dynamic has been simulated using a graph neural network, but it fails catastrophically during production simulations. Uh, what happens is that atoms are never going to, the molecule is never going to explode this in practice and at the temperatures that the simulation is, is being performed. So this is a completely unphysical behavior that's caused by, by the fact that graph neural networks are not really good at extrapolating or actually not good at extrapolating uh, at all in, in, in these systems so far. Um, the lack of robustness of neural networks is not a, a novelty or not anything original. A lot of different examples have been shown in the machine learning literature that for example, Graph neural network, or sorry, net neural networks in general are susceptible to even small perturbations of the input space, such as the ones that we see in the case of adversarial attacks. For example, if you took this image on the left here, classified as a panda, and added a small perturbation to this image, you can make a classifier, a, a CNN classifier, misclassify this image with extremely high confidence as a given, even though the change is imperceptible to the human eye. So this is something intrinsic to, to neural networks that has to be addressed somehow. And in the machine learning literature, it has been addressed by trying to increase the, the robustness of these neural networks to adversarial attacks by, for example, changing the loss function that we're going to use to train the network. So in this typical adversar uh, uh, adversarially robust training uh, routine, what you're going to find is we're going to try to find the neural network weights that minimize a perturbed loss function. 
over here, which could be, for example, the cross entropy loss because of classification. But this uh, perturbed loss function includes here a delta, which is a perturbation that's applied over across the, the whole data set of study, of course, but also where a set of perturb allowed perturbations, uh, capital delta. These perturbations can be just random noise that's applied at train time, and that's uh, applied to purposefully try to make the neural network misclassify these uh, structures. But most importantly, you can also get these perturbations from auto differentiation. You can try to target these points that have uh, that will confuse the neural network the most by by using uh, the the tricks that exist in the case of auto differentiation in order to find to maximize this loss. So this is a, an interesting strategy to try to, to address robustness of neural networks because um, when you actually try to interpret that, what you're gonna see is that even if we try to, to misclassify uh, an image using a given CNN, if we use the traditional uh, standard uh, training method, what we're gonna see is what we saw before with the Panda, but if we use the adversarially robust training, uh, there's semantic meaning that's infused in this idea of misclassification and, and really changing, confusing a neural network. In here, if we wanted to convert or make the uh, CNN misclassify this image uh, as a dog, the amount of perturbations that we have to inject in the image actually changes this image enough for even a human to understand, maybe this is a dog, right? You can see here the nose, you can see here the eyes and you can see some ears over here. And uh, that semantic interpretation is very, uh, very puzzling and very interesting. But uh, in the end, I'm here in this talk, I'm talking about representation learning, and especially for the case of uh, uh, materials and molecules and so on. And so my question really is, I want to do this for the case of neural network potentials. I want to do this kind of sampling new points in the space that are meaningful and that will increase the robustness of my neural network so that in production simulations later, I can have a robust method to, to simulate my materials. Um, so uh, what I did is I, I trained, uh, I proposed a new loss function that takes into account, again, the same format that we saw before is, is over finding the weights that uh, the neural network that minimize this value here of the loss. And, but the loss is actually now a perturbed loss function of a regressor. And these values of energies and forces are perturbed, uh, that have been perturbed. They come from an active learning loop. And we're going to do it for, uh, as before, across a whole data set under study for a set of perturbations that are allowed. And now we just have to find out how to connect this idea of perturbations and perturbed samples to molecular geometries or materials geometries, any, any kind of geometries in general. And that will require finding geometries that maximize a certain uncertainty of the neural network potential. So the idea is we're adding a perturbation to the input coordinates of the molecules, and we're passing this perturbed structure over uh, a neural network committee. And that can be uh, for any kind of architecture. But in this particular study, we use the Schnett architecture, such a way that we can create a potential energy surface with its associated uncertainty for each one of these data points. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to, to, def, do, to get the derivative of the uncertainty and back propagate it and try, and try to optimize this value of delta in such a way that we find the points of maximum uncertainty in this PES. And once we find the points of maximum uncertainty, what we're gonna do is, for example, take this structure and re-simulate it using density functional theory, for example, and re-add it to our data set. Uh, or training set in order to do it over and over to get more robust uh, models with a, a better coverage of the, the sample configurations. So really it's about this loop and what we're gonna be doing and trying to, to do over and over again, over a couple of iterations, but try to be as, as data efficient as we can. Sampling new points basically means that we have to take say, any kind of potential, such as this one that I'm showing here, the double L potential, increase the energy a little bit, perhaps, and go away, move away from the training set, uh, or go towards transition states, which would be very good in terms of sampling, but not necessarily diverging in energy. We don't want to go too far away from the training set because that could be 
uh, not very physically meaningful for the simulations that we're interested in. So really it means that we have to find points of maximum uncertainty, but penalize going towards really high energies, which uh, means that we're gonna have to change what's the value of uh, allowed perturbations that are going to be allowed. Uh, 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 the, the set of allowed perturbations that are gonna be injected at current time in our, in our system. So this can be done using um, using your notions of thermodynamics, dynamics, for example, and, and, and get some inspiration from some statistical mechanics to get some a, a, a value of a partition function based on the energies of the training set, taking all of these different energies and try to find uh, some sort of Boltzmann probability for the, the predicted energies of the ensemble in such a way that we're trying to move away from these energies, you know, from, from these energies of the ground states and, and the, the training set in general, but not too far away. Otherwise, we're, we're going to go to really high energies and that makes sense. So uh, the final objective, adversarial objective, then becomes a, um, a balance between uncertainty, which is this variance over here, and this Boltzmann probability, which prevents us from going too far away from the training set in terms of energies. So if I, if I showed you visually how it looks like, you're gonna see that these darker curves are for lower temperatures, and thus a way to control the exploration exploitation um, knob in this adversarial attacks. And um, that here in the bottom, you're gonna see the adversarial loss that increases for at higher temperatures, but increases for points outside of the training set, which uh, are outside of these regions and these regions over here. So. If you actually try to apply it to, to other systems, what you're gonna see is that if you took, for example, a double well, 2D double well, you, you would try to, to explore the configuration space without necessarily biasing your simulation to go to a second well. So you can start by training a potential that only knows about the first well and predicts, it does not know how to predict the second well to begin with. But as we perform a series of active learning loops and adversarial attacks, eventually it converges to the, the actual potential that we're interested in. And all of these sampling of new points is done automatically. If you want to do it for molecules, an adversarial attack usually looks like something like this. You take the initial configuration of the molecule, increase the adversarial loss by increasing then a, a, a value of variance and even going towards energies that do not correspond to that one that we're, we're uh, looking into as shown over here. Well, and finally, you can analyze how effective is active learning with this technique. If you, if you take the, the zeolite, the example of zeolites, which is very complicated to simulate, as I showed before, and try to perform, to train neural network potential in order to simulate these structures, you can try to get a lot of data to begin with, which is what we did, and train uh, potential and try to see if the simulations explode as I showed example in the, in, in the beginning of this section. And I really do an active learning loop as people usually do by performing more simulations and getting more data. In here, we added over 4,800 different data points, which was very expensive to compute and still not get the final result as a good one in terms of convergence of uh, stability of these simulations. But now if we used our method of active learning and then train an ensemble of neural networks in order to try to predict these trajectories, what you're gonna see is that even if we add 10 times less new data points to the initial training set, we still get better results than the ones we had before with 10 times more data points. And that leads to simulations which can be stable in terms of not exploding and representing physical behavior as we expected. Now, this is all with respect to sampling new configurations and sampling new uh, representations and uh, understanding what makes a neural network potential robust with respect to its coverage of the training data. But now if you actually try to improve the models and finding out how to correlate that representation learning to the machine learning uh, engines that are behind these simulations themselves, we have to try to understand how to look at the idea of loss as I explained over here. So right now I was focusing here on generating new data and finding out what are the new data points of interest. But now I wanted to focus a bit more 
on what makes a model more robust or less robust according to these simulations. So as I, as I showed before, we have to look at the loss function of neural network potentials. And that corresponds to taking a look at finding the weights that minimize a particular uh, loss over here, which sometimes is as something in the, uh, seen here in the bottom, is a loss function that, uh, that penalizes not reproducing the potential energy surface, which is uh, determined by the energies and forces of each one of these data points. And uh, the loss function can be of any shape, but let's say that we had a shape of loss function like this one. And we had two different points in the weight space for the case of neural networks that have an optimized model one and an optimized model two. One of the tricky questions that one may ask is whether optimized models one and two, even when they have the same loss, if they are equivalent or not. So to try to answer this question and to try to see whether models with similar losses are equivalent, and especially in terms of production simulation and stability, we had a look at, we, we looked into lost landscapes of these neural networks, which correspond to taking optimized models, such as the one here with a, a normalized distance of zero towards, of course, itself, the, the optimized models, and then inject perturbations in the model weights now. And these perturbations are gonna be in any randomly sampled direction delta that we have over here in such a way that we can try to then parameterize the loss landscape by these t, given, of course, uh, a direction for near perturbation delta. We can do it in 2D as well, just by generalizing this by sampling two orthogonal directions. And because uh, this is a very uh, large space, space of weights of neural networks, then sampling orthogonal directions or just uh, orthogonalizing them is, is very straightforward. And now with a couple of extra tricks, we can normalize these values so that they're compatible in the case of neural networks, which I'm not going to talk about here. Just wanted to talk about the idea that uh, in the machine learning literature, the idea of loss sharpness was correlated to generalization error. So if you look at minima of losses, which are sharp, if you have a distribution shift between the training, the training set and the test set, you're going to see a large error in terms of generalization for systems that have sharper loss compared to systems that have flatter losses. So we applied this to, to a bunch of systems and molecular systems and, and so on. And what we found is in the case of uh, typical um, well-known neural network intertonic potentials such as NICWIP, which is excellent in terms of, of, of accuracy, in terms of stability, even if you compare the number of layers of, of these systems, what you're going to see is that the time for, for a system to fail in a particular production simulation it may increase over here with the number of layers. But most importantly, this is reflected by the flatness of the loss landscape, as you can see over here by the loss landscape of the energies, loss landscape of the forces. What we did with is we also quantified how flat or how, how sharp was this loss according to this uh, idea of an entropy, defining an entropy of the loss. And uh, we saw that this, this correlation over here existed and, and was maintained in a lot of different tests that we did. Importantly, if you have a look at the actual error, you're not going to see pronounced changes in error of, of, uh, or accuracy of these different models, especially from four layer and five layer, or even three layer to, to four layer. These are small differences in terms of uh, uh, accuracy that are in the order of few milli electron volts per angstrom in terms of forces, are even higher in, in some cases for the case of increasing the number of layers. But because the loss landscape was more favorable for the case of a uh, five layer one compared to a four layer one, that increased the stability by, uh, by a substantial amounts. So we did it for a couple of examples. For example, looking at the training procedure and how the training procedure really affects that and how the number of layers, how the, the all the training parameters hold for the systems. And we actually found these correlation holds for all of these hyperparameters that we explored. It even correlates as well as the RMSC in the extrapolation behavior, which were forces sampled at higher temperatures for all of these different uh, training sets that, uh, that were constructed in the benchmark of interest. So uh, these trends in the stability of molecular dynamic simulations were hold both for the case of 
or metric or measure of, of loss entropy and for, for traditional measures of extrapolation, which require sampling a larger, um, uh, larger amounts of the training set and so on. So um, with, uh, given that it's already, um, we're uh, on time over here, I just wanted to recap this presentation by, by talking about how we saw over the course of the different examples in the case of zeolites, in the case of simulations, in the case of sampling, how representation learning, how these mathematical um, ideas can connect really well, again, with the space of materials innovation and how you know, we can try to explain phase transformation, synthesis, sampling, representation learning using these different concepts. And now um, how this fits back again into the idea of how materials innovation speaks to all of these different aspects of materials design, material synthesis, factorization, and performance, and how can we try to translate that into data that's amenable not only to computers, but for us to, to interpret. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people have, who participated in the work shown over here, um, especially more recently uh, funding here from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the work uh, I've been doing here at LRL. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Daniel. So let's thank Daniel uh, physically, virtually. Thank, thank you very you. much. I'm stopping the recording.